Hello everyone, I'm Phil Diamond, the spokesperson at the U.S. Embassy in Kampala. I'm joined today by Professor Pantiano, Pantiano Kalebo. Uh, welcome, Professor. Thank you. Uh, he is the director of the Uganda Virus Research Institute, or UVRI, and we're pleased to have the opportunity to have a short conversation today about the work of UVRI, the response to COVID-19, the partnership with the U.S. government. Uh, so with that, Professor, if you could tell us first just what is UVRI, UVRI what does it do, uh, and what is generally this large campus uh, mm. consist of? Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, UVRI, Uganda Virus Research Institute, as it stands now, uh, is a, a government institution, but work with many different partners with a mandate of uh, uh, doing research on viral infections. Uh, especially viruses of uh, uh, importance to our country. Uh, it's the only research institution of this kind in the country, but also in the region, that is fully a government institution that is dealing mostly on, uh, uh, on viruses. Uh, and we provide a lot of information, we do research, we do surveillance, uh, we uh, work on viruses for uh, immunizable diseases to test vaccine importance, a number of uh, activities which I'll mention later. So it's really our mandate is to uh, conduct research and studies uh, that are uh, uh, of uh, viral etiology. Tell us a little bit about your role as the director of the institute. What are your main, what's your main job here? Uh, my main job is, uh, I'm, first and foremost, I'm a researcher, I do research, but uh, as a director, I'm supposed to be the uh, the head of the uh, institution, uh, I'm uh, uh, the accounting officer, uh, I make sure that uh, I manage the partnerships, the collaboration, uh, I link between the institution and the Minister of Health, we're under the Minister of Health, uh, so I make sure there's that, that linkage with the uh, Minister of Health and other partners, including uh, the international partners. I'm the spokesperson uh, of the institution. Uh, so I'm, and I'm appointed by the, uh, the, the government uh, to run this institution. Mm -hmm. yeah. How long has UVRI been in existence? Uh, UVRI has been in existence uh, since 1936 and it started uh, as a yellow fever research institution uh, by the Rockefeller Foundation uh, in 1936 uh, to work on uh, yellow fever. At that time yellow fever had been uh, known, but was more in the western part of the world. And there were questions, why don't we have yellow fever moving in the eastern part of the world? So they came here to understand uh, the dynamics, the transmission of yellow fever, and at that time they even discovered the cycles of yellow fever. Mm -hmm. Then in the uh, 50s it expanded, and, uh, it became the uh, East African Virus uh, Research Institute. And during that period, up to the 50s, as they're working on yellow fever, a number of other viruses were discovered that are of international importance. Zika was uh, discovered here in the 40s, West Nile virus, which I, I know colleagues in the uh, USA know very well, West Nile virus, and many, about more than 24 viruses were first isolated here, and other different serotypes. So it became the East African Virus Research Institute uh, in the 50s. In the 70s, the East African community uh, broke and uh, it became, uh, during the time of Idi Amin, uh, around 1974 when the East African uh, community uh, uh, disintegrated, it became the Uganda Virus Research Institute. So it has evolved from uh, Yellow Fever Research Institute, uh, East African Virus uh, Research Institute, and then the Uganda Virus Research Institute what we are now. So we have existed since 1936. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us a little bit about your partnership with the U.S. government and the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, what that partnership looks like and what role the U.S. government played in making UVR, UVRI into what it is today? Well, can't be, UVRI would not be what it is here, here now without those international partnerships and the funding, the collaboration, the work. And the U.S. government has been very key and very, very important. I will not go back the many years back, but if I take you from the, uh, uh, let's say, the 90s, because 
During this, uh, the, the 70s, during the time of the Idi Amin's time and the early 80s, a lot of activities of UVRI really collapsed because of the political instability that we had. Many of our international partners left. A lot of the work came to a standstill. So it was in a very, very bad shape until the 1980s because of HIV, first of all, but also because of stability. And that's when the international partners here really started coming back. Myself, I started working with the uh, U.S. government, CDC, in the 90s because I work on HIV and I visited Atlanta to learn some new techniques for HIV typing. Uh, there were studies on uh, looking at HIV diversity and all that with our colleagues at CDC in Atlanta and they did really help us to build the lab in the HIV. Then they also started having uh, support to bring back our old department of abovirology that was involved in a lot of discoveries. So we started collaborating a lot with the CDC uh, in, in Atlanta and the Fort Collins to bring back the abovirology and discovery. And during that process also, we started talking about emerging and re-emerging infections. There, were, there was Ebola coming up, a, a lot of these infections that we are coming back and new infections. So again, the US government, CDC and others, we started working on emerging and re-emerging infections and they did help us a lot uh, to set up our laboratories that now we use for viral hemorrhagic fever viruses uh, that are supporting the country but also in the region. They started supporting our discovery work, uh, work in, in mosquitoes, in other primates, uh, in, on Ebola. In fact, we discovered uh, Ebola bondibujo, a new strain of Ebola, working with our colleagues uh, at, at, at CDC and the other viruses that are being uh, discovered now. But very important are preparedness. Preparedness for address these emerging and re-emerging infections. It's not many different U.S. Go uh, governments have come in. The Department, uh, the Defense uh, Threat Reduction Agency, DITRA, has supported us uh, quite a lot. USAID, USAID uh, we, we have studies that are supported by, by USAID here. The influenza, in fact, the influenza work that was, UVRI started working on influenza in the 60s as a WHO reference lab for 60s. But as I mentioned, a lot of work really came to standstill when we had instability. But in 2006, for instance, we started working with the influenza division of the CDC. That helped the, 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 the department. And as I'll say later, that's how we really were quickly go, went into COVID to be able to diagnose COVID because of the work we're doing with the CDC in the areas of uh, influenza. So we have worked with CDC in the areas of HIV, in the areas of emerging and re-emerging infections, in the areas of uh, uh, influenza, in the areas we're doing a, a study uh, which is used, uh, looking at uh, long-acting PrEP uh, funded by USID through IAV. So we have had a lot of training, uh, building infrastructure capacity. So CDC has been one of the major uh, supporters, but also other U.S. Uh, government agencies mm -hmm. uh, beyond the CDC. Mm -hmm. And how does the, the daily work of UVRI impact the average uh, Ugandan and make an impact in the average Ugandan's life? Very, very important. And people may not know this. The vaccines that we get for EPI, for polio, for measles, when they're important to the country, our uh, departments need to check that these vaccines are working well. We are in the period of trying to eradicate measles and polio. We check to find out whether we have measles or polio uh, cases within our population, which is very important. Surveillance, we do a lot of surveillance uh, in, uh, uh, in our uh, communities to look for new infections. In HIV, we have done quite a lot. We have participated in providing information. And when I talk about UVRI, I talk about UVRI and the different partners we have. For instance, the Medical Research Council of the UK, which has been here for quite a long time, the Rakai Health Sciences, uh, uh, um, uh, Rakai Health Sciences Research uh, Program, and many others who have worked together, looking at the HIV uh, preference, intervention studies in the areas of microbicides, in the areas of vaccines, in the areas of treatment. We have conducted quite a lot in that, providing we have the reference lab for HIV that tests that. Or, uh, uh, evaluates all the testing kits that come into the country before they are rolled out and to advise on government on the testing algorithm. 
We have the lab that does HIV drug resistance. We host the National HIV Drug Resistance Lab that is hosted here. So in different areas of uh, HIV, uh, immunizable diseases, uh, we do work in emerging, re-emerging infections, but we also have a department uh, that does work uh, on, uh, in mosquitoes to look at what could be the potential, uh, right, likely new potential new infections that could come, that is doing surveillance, looking at uh, what infections are in our insects, mosquitoes, and primates. Mm -hmm. So we're doing quite a lot in terms of surveillance, I could say, in terms of diagnostics, in terms of research, to, uh, to find new interventions for different viral diseases. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, thinking about uh, COVID-19 and the current response, uh, what role is UVRI playing in the response and uh, in what particular areas is the U.S. government partnering with UVRI when it comes to the COVID-19 response? Well, the COVID, when the COVID was recognized, uh, it was end of last year, by the beginning of this year, and then we started getting worried that COVID could come into the country. The lab in influenza that I mentioned has been supported by CDC, started thinking that could we find a new, some new infections among the studies that we're working on. That was surveillance among individuals with severe respiratory infections. They started bringing here samples, but we didn't have the right the tests for COVID. So they were checking for different influenzas. They didn't find anything. But when uh, the tests for COVID came, came in, the uh, staff within these uh, influenza labs went, got the kits and went for training uh, to diagnose for COVID and they came back and the lab became the first lab and the only lab that was testing for COVID in the country. And it's the lab that has provided all the data, all the information uh, on uh, uh, the new infection we are getting. Among, initially among the people who are returning, coming back, the travelers, now at the points of entry and within the communities. Now our role now is to expand and what we are doing now is to train others to make sure that other labs take on because the responsibility cannot be done by one lab. We are training other labs. Makere University has come on. A few days ago we are checking on the gene experts that are going to be rolled out at the borders as a point of entry, as rapid PCR uh, diagnostics. But also we are going to validate, uh, we have been identified as a center of excellence in COVID diagnostics by, by Africa CDC. We are going to evaluate new rapid diagnostic tests so that they can be used because uh, continuing using PCR is quite expensive. Uh, so we think we can uh, diversify. But, so I can say that from the beginning, as you can see from the influenza, that support has come from uh, the CDC. So we have worked with them. But now, even as we expand and the, we, uh, we roll out and we, we, we test our data and all that, we are working with our colleagues in CDC to make sure the lab is efficient, to make sure data collection is, is proper and analysis. So we still have that partnership with CDC that is continuing. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice uh, to the Ugandan people about uh, how we should work best to prevent the spread of COVID-19? I think uh, the government and the Ugandans have been, I think they are all uh, commended. The government was very, came on quickly to implement measures and probably that is largely contributed to why we see low infections. But also the people, they embraced the lockdown, they, they have uh, uh, really been in lockdown. Uh, now the government is relaxing slowly, we hope they will continue relaxing slowly as we monitor so I think the successes, we have not had many infections, most of them are imported and those are the border. We, have not, we are not seeing uh, really community transmission uh, and I think this is all the response by the government and the people. I think our wish is to continue. It's good that the government has followed the scientists, yeah, and we have given advice, I'm part, I'm part of the scientific advisory committee to the Minister of Health, we have provided our advice, but we know as we move forward, it's not only health, we, are, we need to think about the economy, the security and all that, to, uh, taken into consideration. So I can say, let the government continue taking lead, the President has taken a lead, but listening to the science uh, that from our scientists, but also globally, because as you know, 
COVID, you cannot be safe in one country if other countries still have COVID. It's a global issue. We need the whole globe uh, to be safe from COVID. Uh, we're looking forward to the future. Uh, if in case vaccines come on, we have started having some discussions in case vaccines come on to get involved in all this. And we hope the government will be supportive and the communities we shall work together. Well, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, thanks for the great work, and we look forward to continuing our strong partnership. Thank you.